Thank you so much. Sorry. Sure, no problem. Um, so, um, again, this is a meeting of the Metropolitan Mobility Network. It's the first meeting of the group since before the pandemic uh, began. And I will, um, on the second agenda item, we'll talk a little bit about a reminder on the, the charge to the group um, and what this group's function is. But I want to note some meeting logistics before we get into that. First of all, um, all the lines should be muted, right, Fidel? And um, we'll be using the chat pod for questions today. Otherwise, we will get into issues with noise on the line. So we do have Stephanie Brooks, who is in our public affairs office, and she will be monitoring the chat pod. And um, at the end of presentations and so forth, time permitting, we'll be bringing up questions. Um, Moving on to agenda item two, uh, revisiting the charge to the group. So uh, the last meeting was actually in June of 2019. Uh, we have not had this group meet uh, during the pandemic at this point. Um, but it, because of that, I just wanted to remind everyone of the, the reason for this group. It's an advisory group uh, to the New York Metropolitan Transportation Council, which is the Metropolitan Planning Organization for New York City, uh, Long Island and the Lower Hudson Valley. It also advises something called the Metropolitan Area Planning Forum, which is a consortium of 10 uh, metropolitan planning organizations and councils of government in the multi-state metropolitan region surrounding New York City. Um, so there's a pretty broad scope to this group and um, the topics and discussions we have in this group advise a number of organizations that are planning transportation uh, in, in uh, numerous areas. Um, the, the network itself consists of the staffs and member agency staffs of the New York Metropolitan Transportation Council and the MAP Forum member MPOs and COGS. Uh, and the, the staffs that are involved specifically in transportation systems management and operations or TSMO, TISMO as it's called. Um, the network involves other organizations uh, in topics related to TISMO on an as needed basis. And our meetings are open to the public. Um, the network advises and informs uh, NIMTIC and the MAP Forum members uh, generally on areas of TISMO, which includes uh, transportation demand management, uh, active transportation demand management, integrated corridor management, intelligent transportation systems, mobility management, shared mobility, mobility on demand, and mobility as a service. And actually, our keynote today will be talking about uh, mobility as a service and uh, so that's a pretty broad charge to the group uh, that's a lot of uh, information and it's a lot of areas that are uh, undergoing rapid development uh, particularly in light of the pandemic conditions um, so this has always been a very uh, exciting and vital group uh, and the advice that's come out of this group has been very helpful to NIMTIC's members as they plan and enhance their programs and projects in these areas um, so, with that as a bit of background, I'd like to turn it over now to John Simpson, who is NIMTIC staff's mobility coordinator. John will be um, introducing our, our keynote speaker, uh, Kim Lucas from uh, Move PGH. So, John, it's all yours. John, you're muted if you're hearing. Okay, I'm going to step back in here because there's obviously a technical issue here and introduce Kim myself. So our keynote presentation today will be provided by Kim Lucas, the acting director for the city of Pittsburgh's Department of Mobility and Infrastructure. And she'll be presenting on Move PGH Mobility as a Service in Pittsburgh. Uh, as acting director, Kim oversees transportation investments and policies that support the physical mobility needed for the people of Pittsburgh to pursue the economic mobility they aspire to. Key initiatives of the department at present include the design and implementation of a complete network that serves all modes and encourages more sustainable travel choices, resiliency projects to address issues related to landslides and incidents of flooding, policies and programs to manage emerging transportation, including shared services and autonomous vehicles, and strategies, strategies rather, to address long-term maintenance and funding concerns. Uh, prior to this role, Kim was the Sustainable Transportation Branch Manager with the District Department of Transportation Planning and Sustainability Division in Washington, D.C., where she led a team responsible for overseeing the planning and implementation of the shared micromobility, freight and urban delivery, and transportation demand management programs. 
Kim began her career in transportation with her stint as a student bus driver at the University of Virginia and has worked in the cornerstones of transportation planning, the public and private sectors, advocacy and research. So, Kim, we welcome you today. We're happy to have you here to talk about this exciting program and to learn from what you're doing in Pittsburgh. So, thank you for being with us. Good morning and thanks for having me and can everybody hear me? Okay, you're great. Thank you. Awesome. I am no stranger to network issues. So if, if somebody disappears, I will try to get back online as soon as possible. Um, but hopefully everything goes as planned. Um, so thanks for having me today. I'm really excited to talk about our Move PGH program, also known as one of the first mobility as a service programs in the United States today. Uh, next slide, please. First, I wanted to introduce briefly our department. So the city of Pittsburgh's Department of Mobility and Infrastructure is, I think, the newest and youngest um, department within the city of Pittsburgh. We're, we just celebrated our fifth birthday in March. The mission of our department, as you've heard, is to provide the physical infrastructure and mobility uh, to, for our residents to achieve the social and economic mobility that they deserve. And that, as our mission, has five main goals, the number one of which is safety. We believe that it's a basic human right not to be killed or seriously injured, just trying to get where you need to go. Our second goal has to do with accessibility. We want to make sure that all of our residents are able to access their basic needs, such as fresh fruits and vegetables, within 20 minutes travel times of their home. And that includes, if you're taking public transportation, that includes the waiting time for that public transportation mode. Our third goal has to do with short trips. We know that a large percentage of the trips in the city of Pittsburgh are very short, under one or two miles. Granted, if, any, if you've been to the city of Pittsburgh, you know that we have really challenging topography, so not all miles are created equal, but for those where it would be feasible to bike or walk or take you know, a mode that is um, better for, for the person and better for the rest of the folks using the public space, um, we want to make sure that not having access to the infrastructure, not having access to a sidewalk, or not having access to safe in-road um, biking options is not the reason that you're not choosing to take those modes. Our fourth goal has to do with affordability. Like every other city, I think, in the U.S., we've seen housing rise, prices rise substantially. And we know we can't control the cost of housing, and we can't control the cost of energy. Uh, but we do hope that the combined cost of housing, energy, and transportation does not exceed 45% of any household's income, regardless of what that income amount is. And we do that by making affordable forms of transportation, accessible and safe forms of transportation. And finally, we wanna make sure that our streets reflect the pride of our city. And so what that means is that they're beautiful, welcoming, inclusive, accessible, and most of all, safe spaces. Next slide. So what is Move PGH? Move PGH, first of all, is a brand. It's the name of our program um, that is a two-year pilot program connecting Pittsburgh residents, workers, and visitors to jobs and goods and services um, that really is a convening of multiple services into one app and into physical locations that we call mobility hubs. Next slide. This all got started a few years ago when the city of Pittsburgh, again, very new department of mobility and infrastructure realized that we wanted to make it easier for our residents to access the multitude of mobility services that were coming online. At that time, electric scooters were not street legal in the state of Pennsylvania, and they still aren't except for as part of our pilot. So that makes us a little different in terms of a context than many other places in the US today. And we issued a request for proposal and we said, we want the industry to come together. We want a mobility as a service platform where every mobility provider in our city is working together in a streamlined service so that our residents and visitors don't have to download five or six different apps. We want them to be able to access all of your services in one app. So please, industry, come together on your end and propose a single simplified solution for the city. We knew that this would not only be beneficial to our residents, but that it would also be beneficial to the city. You know, you heard that I came from the District of Columbia. We were um, one of the first cities, I think the first city in the United States to launch a bike sharing system called Smart Bike, Smart bike DC in 2008. And then in 2010, Capital Bike Share hit the streets. And in 2017, the first dockless bike hit the streets. 
And since then, many more companies are operating in Washington, D.C. As the person that was managing that program from the city side, I can tell you it can be challenging to have so many different vendors that you're trying to keep track of and to make sure that they're operating according to the permitting requirements that you've put in place. So the city of Pittsburgh had seen those lessons and realized that not only would it be beneficial to have a streamlined mobility as a service platform, which is where, again, residents and visitors only have to deal with one app to be able to access all these services and also unified um, physical locations for these services to come together, but it'd be better for the city's management. Next slide. So the goals of Move PGH are the ones you see here, which very much align with the goals of the department overall and the administration as well. We want to make sure that we are closing transportation gaps by not only providing the, the physical mobility, you know, allowing e-scooters to be on our streets and enabling all these different providers, but also by making it as frictionless as possible to use any of those modes and especially to transfer between them because we know so often, especially for our underserved residents, um, you're not necessarily going to have a bus that's going to get you all the way from your origin to your destination. And we also know that even if there was a transit trip or another mode that might be able to get you the whole way, it might be faster to actually combine modes so that you're getting to the more rapid transit system offering by getting on a shared bike or getting on a shared scooter. And so we wanted to make sure that for the where those opportunities exist, that we're making it as easy, affordable, and safe as possible to use them. Next slide. So who is the Pittsburgh Mobility Collaborative? Before we had the Move PGH brand, we referred to ourselves as the Pittsburgh Mobility Collaborative. And it is, as you can see here, a combination of a number of entities that all have combined and worked together behind the scenes for that seamless experience that the customer experiences in Pittsburgh today. So Domi, that's the government agency that's involved. Innovate PGH is an external third party that is the recipient of some grant funding that has helped to support the management of the program to kind of be the, the project manager in a lot of ways because our department is very, very lean. And um, we knew that by relying on some grant funds and external support that we'd have a more robust program. And we launched with support from the NUMO organization and CityFi, which is a national, perhaps international consulting firm who has worked on projects that are similar in other cities. The providers in Pittsburgh, um, and as you can see here, there's only one provider per mode, and that was strategic, is we have SPIN operating the e-scooter program, Zipcar for car sharing, Waze for carpool, Scooby, which is our moped program, which has about 100 mopeds on the streets of Pittsburgh today and um, is planning to expand soon, and also uh, Port Authority, our local trans public transit system, and Healthy Ride, who just announced that they're rebranding as POGO, and they're refreshing their whole system with brand new equipment, including electric bikes, which you heard me mention the topography of Pittsburgh. We think by having publicly accessible e-bikes all over our city, we're gonna see the number of trips increase and we're really excited about that. And finally, the actual convener of the, the physical and digital locations are transit. So transit is the transit app that I'm sure you all have seen and that you use in your city. Um, Swift Mile is the manufacturer of our scooter parking stations, which I have a picture of later. And Populous is how we're helping analyze the data of the ridership trends, where the trips are being taken, where there might be any issues on the back end. Next slide. So what is the transit app? I'm sure most of you have actually seen it before because it is a robust platform that you see in a lot of cities. Um, but it is our mobility as a service provider. It's where you can have a one stop shop for residents to download a single app. And from there, you can pay for a transit trip on Port Authority. You can locate spin e scooters and stations. You can locate healthy ride stations and you can locate all of these modes in one place. Now, the vision is that we're going to get to a future where you can access all of those modes directly through the app, where you have one app and you can unlock a scooter, unlock a bike, take a trip on transit. We're not quite there yet. That's one of the challenges that we have of that anybody would have by convening all of these different services with all of their different backend systems 
is that getting to that truly deep integration and native integration is not possible yet, but we're striving towards that as a reality. Next slide, please. I think you're working on it, but if not, next slide. Yep, thank you. And um, so not only are we giving people, you know, access to some of those systems directly, we're giving people access to information about those systems. And that's really important. You know, if just like with the transit screens, if you have seen any of those in your offices or transit uh, centers that show you real time information about the modes that are available to you. When you are introduced to that information, you know, if I was opening up just a bike share app, maybe I wouldn't be thinking about taking a bus because I wouldn't know that there was a bus line right next to me. And similarly, if I opened up any of the other individually branded apps, I may not be aware that there are other options that are available to me. So the transit app is not only making access to some of those modes possible, it's, it's raising awareness about all of the modes and their locations and their relevance to you and also helping with trip planning to help you get from point A to point B. Um, we're also working on bundling pricing so that if you are using the transit app to access Port Authority, you may be able to also purchase SPIN memberships through there for a discount. And so we think, you know, while we're advancing towards a future where we've got that native integration and it's all completely seamless, the baby steps to get there include things like financial incentives to use the transit app to combine those modes. Next slide. And that is what I refer to also as the digital location. So bringing all of these services into one digital location. On the screen now is an example of the physical locations. So not only do we want people to be able to see all the modes that they have available to them and access those modes and get information, we want them to be able to transfer between those modes. Um, this Swift Mile station that you see here is doing a number of important things. One, across the street is the access to our light rail station. So this is an opportunity for an organized parking solution that brings together transit and scooter sharing. Um, two, is you can see there's a digital display board. We are selling advertising on that and revenues are going back in to support the operations of not only SPIN, but also of the bike share station, formerly known as Healthy Ride, now known as POGO. And third is that we are also using those digital display boards to have information for people because we know that one of the biggest barriers to great mobility is knowing that that mobility exists and knowing how to use it. And so by leveraging these access points, we're able to raise awareness of passerby. So people who not only are actively seeking that information, but people who can passively learn about our programs as well. As you can see also on the screen that um, we incentivize people financially to use these stations. These are charging stations. So every time a scooter gets docked into one of these stations, they can get charged up, which is it reduces the human touch that's needed from spin staff to go out and pick them up and you know keeps those vehicles in service much longer. It also helps um, you know, in a lot of cities, especially, you know, the cities that have allowed large quantities of e-scooters or dockless bikes um, without requiring or allowing stations, um, a lot, one of the main complaints you get has to do with sidewalk parking or scooters being parked in places that are either illegal or inconvenient or unsafe. And so by having more of these organized opportunities, you have a better program that helps promote your brand overall. Um, and then the one final thing I wanted to mention about these physical stations is they're plugged into our streetlights. So I don't know of another city that's been able to leverage their streetlight system in this way to be able to directly connect, reducing the undergrounding costs, reducing, you know, running additional new conduit um, because the city does own the streetlights and because this is a program that is operating at our request and our benefit, um, we, we, we were able to make it happen. We're not sure, you know, we've started to see some some requests to maybe not always plug into the street lights, but to the extent possible, we would like to continue doing that. Next slide. And as I mentioned, that scooter parking station was right next to a T station and having more than one um, mode of transportation in one physical location makes it a mobility hub. So the mobility hubs, again, are the physical locations that are co-locating multiple forms of transportation. 
right now we have a pretty fluid definition. In some cases, it's a scooter parking corral next to a bus stop. In other places, it might be bike share near a zip car spot. Um, we are advancing um, the development of really robust mobility hubs that will be, you know, the convening of more than two modes and will also have, you know, improved seating and other perhaps free Wi Fi and great facilities for people who are using them. But again, we're taking baby steps there. And so right now, what that looks like is the strategic co location of the scooter parking corrals with the fixed route transit stops and with the bike share stations. Next slide. And I wanted to take a minute to talk about the accessibility of our program. You heard in both our department's goals and also in PGH's goals that we care about accessibility and affordability. The real ways that we have made this happen with our program, and again, Move PGH is the brand for our mobility as a service where we've brought together public transit, so buses and trains, bike sharing, scooter sharing, car sharing, and carpool all into one digital location and into physical locations that are co-located. Um, but a lot of what we also talk about specifically with Move PGH is the scooters because that was the one mode that didn't exist prior to the launch of Move PGH because, as I mentioned, they were not street legal in the Commonwealth of PA. So the programs that I'm about to talk about have a lot to do with the scooters specifically. So in terms of equity, we wanted to make sure that for those mobility hubs and for the scooter parking stations that we were identifying communities that have been historically underserved and have low access to public transit. So what that might mean is that there's public transit service there, excuse me, but it's not frequent or that it's not going the places that people you know, really need to go quickly or they're not super well served by public transit. You know, you can walk, but it might take you 15 minutes to get to something. And we know that scooters and bikes are a great way to get people to that public transit that might get them those long distances. And so not only did we, when we were physically locating mobility hubs and working with SPIN to prioritize the deployment of their devices, um, we also have pricing programs. So not only are there pricing programs for SPIN that are, you know, you sign up and you get discounts, but if you start a scooter trip in one of our access zones, you automatically pay less money for that trip than if you started it outside of an access zone. So what that does is it makes it for a person who is in one of these pre-identified areas benefit from being in that pre-identified underserved area without having to go through the extra steps of signing up for a special program, you know, or documenting their need. And while we do think that it is great and we do advertise for folks to get into those programs because they go a long way, we think that it's one less barrier if you automatically qualify just by being in one of these communities that have been identified. You get an automatic discount on that trip. On the bottom, you can see that we have a guaranteed basic mobility pilot that is scheduled to launch this May. And that is where we further broke down that barrier, because again, we know that access to physical mobility is basically the number one determinant about escaping for escaping poverty. We want to break down as many barriers to mobility as possible. And we know that even with these discounts, it can be expensive to take a scooter trip. It can be expensive to take two bus trips. And so by having our guaranteed basic mobility pilot, we're selecting 50 residents in one of our historically underserved communities, and we're making it practically free for them to use unlimited public transit, a large number of scooter trips per month, a large, maybe unlimited number of bike share trips, et cetera, because we're testing the hypothesis that if you break down the cost and the accessibility barriers of these mobility modes, you're going to see improvements in economic outcomes that perhaps demonstrate that we should be doing something like something like this on a wider scale. And we are actively working with Carnegie Mellon University on this research. It will be a bona fide empirical study because we want the findings from it. We are so confident in the findings that this will demonstrate. We want them to be able to shape policy beyond Pittsburgh. Next slide. So accomplishments so far. Um, we've had over 400,000 trips on e-scooters, and there's only about 1,000 of them out there in less than a year. So think about that. That's over nearly half a million times that someone was able to take a, a trip that they maybe couldn't have taken before, or maybe they couldn't afford to take before, 
or maybe they just they could they could have taken it on their on the bus but it might have taken longer or they could have taken their car but they would have been adding to congestion and so we know that some of those trips would have been taken by other modes or some of those trips would not have been taken at all and so we think that that's an impressive statistic we've installed 20 of those mobility hubs so those co-locations where we've got multiple modes next to each other um, and over 100 parking corrals, which are, you know, just paint on the ground that got, and signage that says park your scooter here. Um, we, one thing I neglected to mention about our program is unlike many cities, you're not allowed to ride or park your scooter on a sidewalk in Pittsburgh. Um, that is because we wanted to respect the pedestrian space. And especially in some of our older neighborhoods, we've got really, really constrained sidewalks if they exist at all. And so by straight across the board saying you're not allowed to be on sidewalks, we knew we needed to have a robust system of parking in the curb area. And so to enable that, we've installed over 100 parking corrals in addition to the mobility hubs. And we're excited to see the integration of e-bikes into our network this spring. Next slide. So what's next for the program? As I mentioned, we are really excited about the guaranteed basic mobility pilot that's scheduled to launch next month. We're looking for ways to expand it by seeking additional funding because we think right now we're looking at, I believe, a six month pilot. We think the longer the pilot or the more participants in the pilot, the better data we'll get. So we're actively trying to grow it. We have 30 more mobility hubs that we're currently engaged in public outreach on right now. And we hope to have deeper and better integration in the transit app so that one day people will be able to unlock a bike, start a scooter trip, and you know, maybe start a zip car all from within the app. And we're striving towards a shared mobility master plan. So this is a two year pilot. We're less than one year into it. We know that we've got some good findings and that we want a strategy for the future because we, as I mentioned, e-scooters especially are only enabled within the Commonwealth of PA as part of this pilot. So we wanna make sure that we're able to demonstrate and document these findings to encourage at the state level, the approval and permission for these to continue on. Next slide. And thank you. So I'm happy to answer any questions if we have time. Kim, thank you so much. And uh, that's a very impressive program. We do have some questions in the chat pod, but I actually want to lead off. Um, because this program is is so comprehensive, uh, both on the app side and the mobility hubs, uh, one question that comes to mind for me is how long did it take you to actually develop it and bring all these parties together? Yeah, so I believe, so I started with the department in fall of 2019. And I remember going to conferences at that time, you know, I think maybe the shared use mobility conference or NACTO and seeing members of the, um, the, of the Pittsburgh mobility collective. So they existed and they were kind of like, well, what are we doing? You know, what is what now we're in the PMC, what are we doing? And so it's, it took years, it, you know, scooters launched in July of 2021. So that's at least two years in advance of that, that the PMC was stood up and um, striving towards the goal. So it, it did take a number of years. I don't know if it would have taken as long if the Commonwealth had allowed scooters to exist earlier, you know, and we could have launched perhaps in advance of e-scooters being available. But we really did want to kind of wait until all of the members and components of the mobility of the service could be used prior to flipping the switch on it. And so, uh, you know, we did, it was a hurry up and wait situation for at least a few months in there. One thing I also neglected to mention is that the city does not pay into this program. So even though we issued a request for proposals, we are not in a contract. We are not paying these providers. Um, we do have an operations agreement and we do um, have permits that they pay for. Um, and for spin trips specifically, there's a cost for every single trip that is set aside to be invested into improving the infrastructure within the city. So sometimes, you know, people will say, you know, we've got potholes. We maybe had a bridge issue recently. Why would the city be investing in scooters and bikes when there's these other higher needs and our answer is we're not we're not spending city money on this and so in fact these are generating revenue that we're using to invest in our infrastructure directly so it's a win-win-win 
Thanks. That's very informative. So, um, Stephanie Brooks, uh, we have a number of questions coming in on the chat pod. Can you, uh, can you take them uh, at this point? Absolutely. Um, we have from Joseph Chow. You mentioned earlier that data is shared with the city. Is the basic mobility pilot data available to researchers? That's a really great question. Um, so. I would think so. Um, I'm, I'm. We're going through a whole data governance um, program right now at the city of Pittsburgh. So I'm kind of I'm trying to wrap my head around that specific question. In general, yes. If it's not personally identifying, then I would believe that we could make that information available. Great. Thank you. Um, the next question from Nikhil Puri is: Could you elaborate on the financial incentive? Uh oh, someone cut off. But I think the, I heard financial incentives, so that oh, might have. Um, could you elaborate on the financial incentives that you touched on earlier in the presentation? Sure. So, for for parking, there's a one dollar trip uh, discount if you end your scooter trip in a in a station. So that's one of our financial incentives that's in place, or one of Spin's financial incentives that's in place to encourage good stewardship of their assets. And then um, in terms of our affordability programs, and I'm going through um, the presentation now, there's the spin access program, which for low income users provides a 75% discount on their scooter trips. And in the access zone, which was the geographic discount, where if you start your trip in a zone that's been pre-identified, then you get a 25% discount off of that trip. Um, and those areas are identified based on equity equity areas from the Port Authority, which is our public transit provider, um, their research and their data. And so you can either sign up for a program and get 75% off, or just by starting a trip, anybody within these communities gets 25% discount off the posted rates. Excellent. That's amazing. Um, okay, another question. Do you plan to use simple, consistent road markings? So just one marking with uh, not two or three. I don't know if I totally understand the question. I think. Could you elaborate? I'm, I'm not really sure myself. I think um, maybe in the in the chat, if the, if the question could be. Um, elaborated, a I think bit. it's. I think it sounds like the question might be, for example, you've got a zip car parking space, you've got a scooter parking area, you've got a bike share parking area. Are they branded as move PGH or are they branded as zip car pogo and um, scooters for the branded spaces like zip car where the company is paying for that space and it's reserved for them and it's, you know, their logo. It is branded as Zipcar because they are the one provider. They're, it's not Move PGH car share. It is Zipcar car share as part of Move PGH. So it is branded that way. Um, for the scooter parking corrals, we it is generic. It doesn't say spin parking in terms of the roadway markings. It just has iconography that says you know park here basically, and hey. pictures of scooters or bikes. Thank you. Um, the next question: Which modes can be paid for or booked uh, via the app? That you mentioned. Um, so, via the transit app, you can use Port Authority, and there was you can pay for Port Authority trips, and there was for a while, and I'm not sure if it still exists, a free transfer between Port Authority and Healthy Ride. So that was the bike share program. Um, I know that Spin unfortunately is not fully integrated into the transit app in terms of being able to unlock a scooter, but in the absence of that, that's why the pricing bundles are being explored, where if you are paying for Port Authority through the app, then you get access to dis further discounted pricing for SPIN. Um, I think, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. And then for the bike share also, I think that they're gonna be able to be unlocked in the app. We're working on that now. We have a proposal on the table to fund the integration of the new iteration of the bike share system into the transit app. So that is something that's being explored to be able to unlock the bikes directly from it. Unlocking them directly. Okay. I believe so. Uh, next question is, um, what was the biggest challenge? Uh, use of a common payment platform or something else? Uh, that's the first part of the question. And the second part is how is the service promoted and by whom? 
Yeah, so, you know, as I just explained, they're not all, there is not a common payment platform yet because unfortunately not all of the services are 100% accessible through the app, but that is sort of the barrier. You know, it's making sure not only the payment systems, but for example, if you're getting on a spin scooter, there are extra, um, there's extra information before you take that first ride that you need to provide to spin. You know, they, they need identification from you. Um, they not only need the payment, but they also need you to take, you know, a safety quiz and things of that nature. And my understanding is that some of those extra elements that you don't need to have when you're taking a public transit trip, for example, are one of the barriers to being able to have that na fully native integration into transit app. Um, also, the nature, you know, quite frankly, I, without being a tech person per se, I imagine that these barriers are surmountable, but with the impact from the COVID pandemic and the decline in ridership on a lot of modes and, and, and the subsequent economic impacts on some of the modes, the cost to actually, you know, explore some of these integrations, I think, um, are now a little out of sight for right now. Thank you. Um, one more uh, chat was, uh, hi, thank you so much for your presentation. Awesome work. One question that comes to mind, uh, wondering if the local Port Authority public transit system allows bringing e-scooters and bikes on transit. Uh, if not, is there a consideration to locate micromobility near public transit facilities or integrate them somehow? There is. So our mobility hubs are just that, where we are strategically putting in either swift mile stations or, you know, a, a marked scooter parking corral or bike share station adjacent to light rail stations or um, bus stops. So definitely. Thank you. Um, uh, and for the same person, uh, for micromobility micro mobility in Pittsburgh, is the entire city covered by a sort of a geo-fenced zone? Um, they're curious about the equity priority areas and whether, and whether every place is covered in this geo-fenced area. So, yes, the entire city of Pittsburgh public space is eligible for spin scooter trips. We, when we, especially when we were initially rolling out, we had priority areas that we required spin to have a certain number of scooters within um, on a daily basis, their deployment zones, because we wanted to make sure that they weren't just deploying their scooters in places that were you know, super high use, which are often also often, you know, high density, more expensive places to operate as well or to live. Uh, Stephanie, just stepping in here for a second, uh, just a quick time check. Um, this uh, agenda item is scheduled through 11. Uh, we're getting some really good questions, so we want to keep going with those. Um, and if, if it's okay with Kim, um, we'd like to continue because these are some excellent questions. Sure. Okay, go for it, Stephanie. Right, uh, one more question. The MUTCD has multiple options. Um, noting that this is distracted driving month options for road users must be reduced. Um, I think the our crosswalks road art or a safety issue. Um, I think so that's a question. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> so that doesn't sound like a question for me with regards to move PG. But let, let, let me turn it into a question for you. Um, uh, yes. Actually, Kim, so given that, um, and given the fact that mobility hubs uh, gather people, uh, sometimes often uh, pedestrians, um, are there any, are, is there any connection between the program and access to those mobility hubs that are physical uh, in terms of street markings and signage and so forth? I see what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, I think, by nature, the locations where we put the mobility hubs are places that we anticipate pedestrians being because you are a pedestrian before and after every single other mode that you take. Um, and especially when it comes to accessing public transit, those are places that we know um, are higher crash locations in our city specifically. So we issued or published our pedestrian safety action plan in 2021. That was a plan that came out of some data exercises with FHWA that started in 2017. So it took a few years for us to get it over the finish line. And what that identified were high risk and high need corridors for prioritized pedestrian investment. 
And what it also recognized was that many of our higher severity crashes are happening near transit stops. So that's the long way of saying we know that the natural places where a lot of our pedestrian crashes and crashes and issues are happening overlap with the places that pedestrians are, which are nodes to transit and no and scooter use. And so we are making lots of safety improvements citywide and we we do prioritize those investments based on being near where people are, such as corrals and mobility hubs and and just general pedestrian movements. Thanks so much. Um, we have a question that uh, just said great presentation. In my experience, advertising has been a challenge at transit stops and scooter parking locations that would help to support maintenance, et cetera. Um, was this a challenge for you and the city? You know, um, we have had bus shelter advertising in Pittsburgh for a number of years. That's how we pay for our bus shelters is through a contract where we say you can advertise, but you have to install a certain number of shelters. And then we've got a revenue share above and beyond that. Um, so there was already a precedent for advertising on our transit facilities that I know, for example, Arlington County, Virginia, where I worked many years ago, we were not allowed to do. Um, so already we had a leg up in that regard. I believe these were the first digital screens that um, were implemented in our public space. But as I highlighted, we're showing transit information. We're putting up PSAs. We're putting programmatic information. So I believe that we were successful in part because these are digital information displays in addition to having advertisements on them. Hey, thank you. Um, next question is during the establishment of the collaborative partners, were they competitively selected? Yes, so this was an RFP process and my understanding, because this does predate my joining the department, that there were other offers that came forward, including some big brand name systems that we would recognize here. And at the time, it was a strategic decision to go with this collective of a number of smaller entities instead of going with one of the major TNC providers um, because we wanted to have that diversity in the marketplace. Hey, thank you. Um, quick question about why uh, is the organization being asked not to plug the charging stations into streetlights? I have uh, what issues have risen from this practice? I don't know that we've had a major issue per se. Um, I I'm trying to recall now why I've heard some pushback on it and who it's from. Um, I think it's just sort of like a policy philosophical concern on the behalf of maybe some of the street light operators. We own over 40,000 street lights in the city of Pittsburgh and maintain them. Um, but there are a couple other utility providers who have poles that I think maybe we've approached about plugging into and they're not super enthusiastic about it. Um, but to date, knock on wood, I haven't heard of any safety or other issues. And in fact, we do want in we are right now, we have an RFP out for the conversion of those 40,000 ish high pressure sodium lights to be converted to LED for the environmental and energy savings um, benefits. And as part of that, we are exploring like, okay, we know we want electric vehicle charging citywide and we know we want more scooter charging citywide and we want to have these access points. How do we leverage this big conversion project to also enable that? So while right now we're getting a little bit of friction on um, plugging into the lights, I don't know that we've actually seen any negative impacts. And we'd really love to, when we're doing this big overhaul of our street lighting network, um, make it even easier to do that, if at all possible. Excellent. Thank you. Um, one more question asked, is, the serv is this service that you're talking about restricted to the city or does it extend beyond to neighboring municipalities as well? So the e-scooters are restricted to the city. I believe, I don't even want to speak on, I would imagine you're not allowed to operate them outside of the city of Pittsburgh because they are only allowed by the state as part of this pilot. Though I know that there was some legislation rolling through to enable other jurisdictions to also um, participate. Um, with bike share trips, you technically could take them outside the city, I believe, but you'd have to return them and, and finalize your trip within the city. And then, of course, public transit, um, the Port Authority is a countywide service. So you could um, access that throughout the county. 
Stephanie, I think we have time for like two more questions. I have two left. <laughs> so just super quick. Um, a quick, a quick follow up to the app integration question. Understanding that there are challenges, but full integration with like transit scooter, bike, share, car share. That's the ultimate goal for the app, right? Correct. That is definitely our goal at the city. You know, of course, with coordinating so many different entities, even though we're coming together and we share a goal, we recognize that without it being, a, you know, a white label app that the city owns and 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 designs, we are a little bit, um, you know reliant upon the willingness and interest of all those other parties. But that is the vision we have at the department, absolutely. We want it to be as easy as possible to access the mobility that people need and deserve. And then uh, one more question. Have you seen an increase in multimodal trips due to the availability of this pilot? And if so, what kind of data are you tracking for that purpose? You know, that's a really good question. Um, we've definitely seen an increase in people riding scooters because they weren't before or they were, but on such a small scale because they had privately owned scooters that seeing, you know, close to half a million trips at this point um, is substantial on a thousand devices is substantial and cannot be understated. Um, we are still evaluating how those trips are connecting to public transit. We are able to see where trips were picked up and dropped off. Um, and there are some capabilities through the app to kind of say, did somebody make a connection between the two? But I don't know that we have the clearest picture of that yet. And we also, you know, we are substantially down still in public transit ridership due to COVID and the changing work locations. You know, for example, our downtown is at, you know, very, very low occupancy of what it once was daytime occupancy. And so it's also a little hard right now since we launched in the pandemic to to really draw conclusions, but we know people are using it to get to other modes of transportation. We see where the scooters are being left and we see how people are using our uh, parking stations that are near other modes. And we're working to get a clearer picture of exactly how much that's happening. Excellent. Um, there was a question about getting a copy of the presentation. Um, is that something that is feasible? By yeah, any actually, I could answer that because uh, Kim has provided us with that. Uh, we will be posting this on our website along with the recording of the entire meeting. So the answer is yes, and we'll let people know when uh, when that's available. There's been some comments about what great work it is and an expert level of coordination across stakeholders. Uh, we did just get two more questions. Do we have time for those or we'll just um, really quick. Uh, Okay, quick, quick question. Um, uh, I appreciate that your goals are ambitious and responsive to the needs of the community. Um, but how do you plan to measure the household housing and transport below 45%? Is there a reason that there is no explicit vehicle miles travel reduction goal? You know, that's probably a longer answer that I don't have totally right now. Um, but we're looking at affordability. We know that some of the most, I hesitate to say harmful, but the trips that are having a really big impact on congestion and air quality and perhaps safety in our city are very short trips. And so I think pursuing just a straight up BMT reduction might not actually achieve what we would want to see because we are not dealing with many you know, high mile trips. We're dealing with, two mile trips. And so by targeting those very short trips, not only are we looking at really solving for people who are going 10 miles, and it would be much more challenging to solve that problem. We're focusing on the, the lower hanging fruit, which is you're going one mile. Let's talk about why you're taking a car for that trip. And let's see how we can help you find other modes if you're interested. Um, relatedly, you know, e-scooters are not accessible. They're not accessible for a lot of people. A lot of people don't aren't able to balance on them. You're not gonna wanna, you can't, or you shouldn't, and you probably don't want to take your small child on them. They might not be the greatest for picking up groceries. So one of the benefits of having this relationship that we have with a single operator is that we're actively having conversations about what the next form factor should look like for the devices that are on our streets. You know, We want something that really is gonna be more accessible for somebody with their child and with parcels. Um, you know, if that ends up having to be, you know, more car sharing, then so be it. That is a really valuable mode. And we absolutely are trying to increase the availability of shared cars in our city. 
Um, but we think there's also something in between, you know, if we could see e cargo bikes, for example, or something that makes it just a little safer and a little easier to get around with parcels or people. Um, that's what we're also striving for. In addition to that fully integrated app, we want to see a, a better form factor that serves more people. Excellent. We did get 2 more questions very quickly. All right, if we don't have time, um, I, I, uh, I understand how, how are we on time? Jerry. One uh, last question. Okay. Um, have most of the increase in transit trips, referring to all modes, been mostly off peak or during peak periods? I know you mentioned COVID, so I don't know if that's if that shifts that result, that question or um, or what. Yeah, I don't have the I don't have the information in front of me right now for that. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Um, Hyper local advertising with all partners uh, geolocated is that something you're looking at uh, for the app? Um, considered using geolocation. To weave in hyper local advertising, and that's the last question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a really good question because I don't know that we influence the advertising that's happening in the app. Or are you saying that you know when someone's walking past a station, we want Facebook to tell them that mobility hubs are there and that um, Move PGH is a thing they should take? Uh, I don't think we have too much influence on the former, but on the latter, we're absolutely interested and curious and trying to get our programs in the hands of people that could benefit from them in any way possible. Well, just, okay. in, just in time. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> Stephanie, thank you. And, and Kim, thanks for your patience. Uh, a lot of great questions. Thanks to the audience for throwing a lot of stuff at you. And, um, uh, it's, it's, as I said before, Kim, it's a very impressive effort. And, uh, I think 1 of the reasons for the questions is people are recognizing. All the work that Pittsburgh has done and you've done to to pull all this together. Um, so we really One appreciate. Last plug. It. Yeah, go ahead, <laughs> go for it. One last plug. You know, this wouldn't have been possible without the vision of Karina Ricks, our former director, who is now at the Federal Transit Administration. So I believe that there are some funding opportunities if you want to try to stand up a similar program. I believe the FTA is working on. Um, making funding available to do so. So I would definitely reach out to her or look into the FTA and the stuff that they're brewing right now, because if this was really exciting to you, I know that they've got some leadership within their administration that would like to see you be successful at it as well. Excellent point. Thank you for that plug and that advice. And thank you for teaching us about how to, uh, how you got this done in Pittsburgh. Absolutely. Uh, feel, feel free to stay with us if you'd like, it's up to you, but if not, we understand and, and, um, and thanks again for a great presentation. Okay, uh, we're going to move on. Uh, we're actually in uh, good stead in terms of time. We did identify or we did locate uh, John Simpson in cyber limbo. So I'm going to turn it over to him so he can do a agenda item for John. Thank you, Jerry. Um, our next agenda item is going to be a roundtable report on a variety of transit service and mobility planning initiatives underway or concluding in the region. Uh, like before, audience questions should be entered into the chat pod and we will get to as many as time permits. Uh, we will start off with David Vienna with Nassau County's Shared Mobility Management Plan. Take it away, David. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, Jerry, should I share my screen? Or oh, you got it. Okay, excellent. I think the answer is yes, David. Okay. Just wait for that to pop up. Um, yeah, just full screen if you can. All right, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is David Viana. I am a planner at the Nassau County Department of Public Works on Long Island. Uh, looking forward to giving you two brief updates on uh, transportation initiatives that our uh, department has been working on. So the first one, uh, if you could just go to the next slide, please. All right, so the first one is the Nassau County Shared Mobility Management Plan. Uh, this is a UPWP funded project. Uh, so thank you, NIMTEC, for, for helping us uh, get this project underway. Um, this study is going to develop a guiding plan for implementing and integrating shared mobility services within Nassau County. For our purposes, we define shared mobility as covering uh, three general areas, and that's micro mobility, micro transit, and car share or ride hailing. So within micro mobility, that's obviously focusing on the smallest of our modes uh, being bike share, scooter share, moped share. Uh, in micro transit, we're looking at flexible on demand services, um, shuttles, um, paratransit, and then 
finally, the car share and ride hail uh, self-explanatory, but that's covering your Ubers and your Lyfts. So all of those services together, uh, we believe can help address uh, a number of different goals of the county. Uh, that's uh, covering uh, improving transportation options for underserved populations and communities. That's addressing longstanding transit gaps, such as uh, our limited north-south uh, transportation routes within Nassau County. And then it's promoting social equity, economic development, and sustainability, uh, which is not only a goal uh, for Nassau County, but it's a, a shared goal uh, for a number of municipalities uh, within Nassau County. We see the opportunities uh, in shared mobility uh, to help increase options for cyclists and pedestrians. Uh, it'll improve access to existing fixed route services, such as the Long Island Railroad and our Nassau Intercounty Express uh, bus services. And then finally, it'll connect uh, downtowns and business districts all across the county um, with other key destinations that would make sense to be linked to those services, be they uh, you know, recreational destinations, cultural destinations, uh, work, education, um, et cetera. You can go to the next slide, please. So this is a 12 month study. Uh, we anticipate the study completing in the summer of this year. Uh, it began just around the summer of last year. Since then, um, we've accomplished a number of different tasks and I'll just outline that briefly for you. So our study has uh, a three pronged approach to develop a comprehensive final plan. The first is to have a robust public outreach effort. Since then, we've completed a public and employer survey um, that was completed in the summer of last year, and it was very successful. We had over 5,000 respondents um, uh, re respond to the survey during the, the summer. Um, that uh, survey process provided us with some very valuable data on transportation patterns and trends uh, within Nassau County. It looked at it from a, a pre-COVID, a during COVID, and a post-COVID um, approach. Um, that data is helping to inform our final plan um, and will you know, include additional public outreach as needed. We've also uh, used a stakeholder committee that has uh, represented a diverse um, a set of, of organizations and agencies covering uh, transportation, covering environmental and sustainability issues, uh, as well as social equity, and uh, business development. We've also been coordinating on the technical side with um, uh, our 69 municipalities. So we have 64 villages that have been represented through our uh, Village Officials Association. And then we individually met with our three towns and our two cities, as well as um, Nice Bus, uh, the Long Island Railroad, and um, our other transit providers. The second prong is scenario planning, and that's looking at uh, the future in short, medium, and long-term uh, scenarios. So that's helping to inform um, how transportation may look in the future, especially in light of uh, the changing dynamics um, uh, as a result of COVID. Um, and then finally, the, the third prong is to utilize the pilot project development uh, approach. And that is going to include one or more shared mobility pilot projects that will be targeted in uh, specific areas of the county. And that will be developed in conjunction with uh, our stakeholder committee as well as uh, the general public. So, if you would like additional information on shared mobility, we have a project website. It's www.nassomobility.com. Um, you can get all the information about the study there. Um, if you have any questions, you can email shared mobility at nassaucountyny.gov, and that is our uh, project team uh, email. You can go to the next slide, please. So the second initiative I wanted to touch on briefly is the um, uh, introduction of our uh, electrified uh, bus fleet for NICE bus. We have ordered our first six electric buses and they will be delivered by the end of 2022. They are new flyer um, uh, battery electric buses or BEBs for short. Uh, we intend to put them into service in the beginning of next year, 2023, and they'll be utilized for a new bus rapid uh, transit system that will serve uh, the general Nassau hub area, the core of Nassau County, uh, it'll run from the Rosa Parks Hempstead Transit Center uh, and go to Rizzo Field Mall. And along that route, it'll serve key destinations, including the Nassau hub and the Nassau Community College. The vehicles will be charged at a new uh, charging facility that's being constructed at the NICE uh, headquarters in Mitchell Field, which is also in the center of the county. Um, so that is uh, a major project underway that is actually uh, repurposing a former brownfield site 
um, to now serve as the the charging station. So we're very excited about that project. Um, you know, it's it's bringing in a lot of different elements from sustainability, um, you know, improved reliability of our of our fixed route service, um, and like I said, re repurposing um, a former site that has been an issue for us for for quite a while. Um, so I, I know I'm short on time, so that is the the summary of of the two initiatives. You know, we're very excited about both of these because it takes uh, a look from the shared mobility side, the smaller side of transit to our existing uh, fixed route fleet. Um, so we're we're trying to balance uh, improvements on on both ends. Um, but if you guys have any questions, um, you can just go to the next slide. My contact info is on the uh, on this slide, so feel free to reach out to me. Um, or our project team, and we're, we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, David. Our next up will be Chris Chatterton with Suffolk County's Reimagined Transit Initiative. Chris, the floor is yours. Hi, good morning. This is Chris Chatterton with Suffolk County. Can everyone hear me? Yep, we can hear you. You're good, Chris. All right, great. Um, so, yeah, I'll give you guys an update on the Suffolk County's Reimagined Transit Initiative. Uh, we're currently nearing the end of the study phase of the Reimagined Transit effort, which is a blank slate redesign of the Suffolk County transit system, which will decide where the buses will go, when they should run, and how frequently they'll operate. So just to give some background, a year ago, a Choices and Concepts report was developed by the county and our consultants. Jared Walker and Associates. Um, this report assessed the existing transit network and developed two alternative draft networks to be presented to the public, one that favored maximizing coverage and one which favored maximizing high ridership. Uh, following the report, we engaged in a public outreach process to determine which of these alternatives was preferred by riders, stakeholders, elected officials, and the general public. So we used that input, um, went back to the drawing board, and developed the draft new network, which was released in December of 2021. So based on public preference, the draft new network was designed with a focus on ridership. Whereas at present, I'd say about approximately 50% of Suffolk County transit service is used to achieve high, achieve high ridership goals and the remaining 50% is used for coverage goals. This changes in the draft new network with a slant of 65% toward ridership goals and 35% towards coverage goals. So the draft new network that was developed, it contains fewer routes overall, but more routes are now providing 30 minute service, more routes providing earlier and later service, and all routes providing seven days a week service whereas today we only have 12 of our 42 routes providing service on Sundays. Um, one of the key features of the draft new network is that at many locations where routes meet, there will be planned time connections, which means that buses coming from multiple routes would be at the stop at the same time, um, reducing waiting time. Uh, we are also going to be addressing reliability and on-time performance with the new network. Um, over the last few years, the, the speed on Suffolk County transit routes has declined because of increased congestion across the county and timetables that have not been updated in, in quite some time. So when the speed of service uh, goes down, either we have to update these services or the service is gonna keep getting perpetually behind schedule. Uh, to address this, the draft new network has roughly 15% more service hours built in compared to existing schedule to account for that slower speed so that our, um, our budgeted resources are in line with actual operations. Uh, just to highlight some of the draft new network improvements, the new network is going to make our Southampton on-demand uh, zone permanent. Uh, we currently have one uh, pilot on-demand service zone, um, which began last year in the um, eastern part of the town of Southampton. So we're going to be adding a new on-demand zone in the new network as well um, in the um, Springs, East Hampton, and Montauk area, which will replace inefficient fixed routes, which once ran through there. We're going to be quadrupling the number of high-frequency 
which we consider to be 30-minute all-day routes from 3 to 12. We'll be extending evening and weekend service system-wide. Um, as mentioned, the, the time connections um, and fixing long-standing on-time performance and reliability issues. Some figures we'd, we'd like to share um, will be the new network will increase the number of jobs the average Suffolk County resident could reach within an hour of their front door by 48%. It'll put 40% of residents and more than 50% of job sites within a half mile of a high frequency route. It'll increase job access for residents without cars by 53%, increase job access for low income residents by 59%, and increase job access access for residents of color by 67% on average. And it will more than double the number of people and jobs that are near service that comes every 30 minutes or better all day. So um, we recently held public meetings on this draft new network at the end of March, and our public comment period remains open through the end of April. We've already received a lot of feedback, both what people like and what people don't like and we will be incorporating that feedback into the final new network plan. Um, our consultant, Chair Walker and Associates, will also produce for us uh, new system timetables. Once we have the network and the timetables uh, all finalized, we will be going out to RFP for the maintenance and operation of the new network, which we aim to implement in July of next year, according to the current timeline. Um, if anyone would like more information, you can access our project website through connectli.org and look up Reimagine Transit. And that's what I have. Thank you. Hey, John. Yep. Okay. Um, thank you, Chris. Uh, we'll move on to Naomi Klein with the Westchester County Mobility and Bus Redesign Study. Oh, good morning, everyone. I'm Naomi Klein. I'm Director of Transportation Planning for Westchester County. Um, our bus system redesign is uh, well underway. And just as background, we're undertaking the study uh, for many of the same reasons that other bus systems have done re redesigns, um, trying to make our system more efficient, take advantage of new technologies, and um, address trends that were happening uh, before the pandemic, such as declining ridership and competition uh, from transportation network companies and a, a whole um, slew of other uh, factors. Um, like other systems, we're um, undertaking a clean slate approach. Uh, we have the consulting firm Nelson Nygaard on board to help us. Um, and really looking at how people travel, where they travel, uh, what are the travel markets, and then identifying, well, what is the best way to serve those markets? And in some ways, it's with fixed route service. Some, and in other instances, we're taking a look at um, opportunities for micro mobility uh, zones. We've done extensive public outreach. Uh, we had a website, an online survey. We did uh, about 16 focus groups and reached uh, a lot of people. The, a lot of it was virtual, um, the, focus, the uh, outreach, because it was done during the pandemic. And we, we reached a variety of groups, um, municipal officials, social service agencies, um, hospitals, housing authorities, colleges, many different types of businesses. And, um, uh, some of the, the main themes that came out of the outreach were how transportation is key to access to jobs and getting people out of poverty. And I think Kim uh, Lucas mentioned this also in her uh, presentation. Some other things unique to Westchester, just the need for more east-west travel. The rail lines in the county are north-south north oriented, and, and so are the, the major roadways. Uh, and also more weekend uh, service and greater span of service. And we divided the, the responses to our outreach by um, existing riders, existing bus riders and uh, non riders. So right now uh, we're kind of developing all the alternatives for the fixed route service and we're adding, we're looking at adding some new routes, um, modifying some, some eliminations. And uh, we're also looking at uh, micro transit zones and 
um, looking at examples with other transit operators and their experience with them. And um, we have to, we realize we have to be very careful about how we design them. We want them to be, um, we understand they can be flexible. We can make changes to them. Um, but, but really considering, you know, should, should any people be able to travel anywhere within a zone or should it be say from within a certain zone to a, a downtown or a train or a train station? Um, another major recommendation that has come um, out of our study has to do with uh, the idea of um, fair parity and um, having fair parity with uh, Metro North. So the, the idea would be that um, there would be free transfers between Metro North and Beeline uh, within Westchester and the base fare the, um, on Metro North within Westchester would be uh, $2.75. And uh, the idea is that this, this kind of approach would uh, address issues of equity, make the system more affordable, um, improve overall mobility and better connectivity um, between Beeline and Metro North and just make better use of both modes, um, really reduces the cost of travel for low-income populations who don't tra transfer uh, because it's um, cost prohibitive and it, it also removes um, these penalties for very long trips. Um, just just as an example, um, right right now on um, uh, the trip, say from Mount Vernon East um, to New Rochelle, takes about thirty minutes on B line, um, but on the Metro North New Haven line, it's only seven minutes. Um, but people don't necessarily take the railroad for that kind of, that trip because they might be then transferring to another B line bus. And they can transfer for free from one B line bus to another. But if they transfer from Metro North B line, they have to pay a double fare. And right now, there's um, free transfers between B line and MTA buses uh, and subways. So we'd like to bring that opportunity to riders who are are transferring to the railroad. Um, so uh, we we're um, uh, you know looking into that. We've had uh, meetings with uh, senior staff at uh, at the MTA, and um, uh, we're hoping also to start with our next round of outreach um, uh, in in late spring. Um, and uh, that concludes my report. Thank you. John? Yep. So, Mark Heavey, uh, if you are able to, um, we would uh, like to hear about the MTA bus network redesign. Um, if you are able to, given uh, um, all right, take it away, Mark. Mark, you're muted. Mark, you're muted. Sorry, John, I couldn't get into the uh, WebEx while I was engaged <laughs> in the uh, shared screen. Can okay. you still see my screen? No, we cannot see your screen. Not. Okay, let me do that again. I just gonna open you. Okay, better. No, we're. Yeah, now we can now see. We go, now we can see it. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Okay, just a quick update on where we are across our five boroughs with our uh, bus network redesign. Um, as much like Naomi just mentioned, our goals align in terms of improving bus travel times and reliability. That means increasing frequency of our buses, more direct routes, balancing our bus stop spacing, uh, meaning skip stop where necessary, uh, enhancing connectivity to other modes of travel, and then expanded bus priority, meaning dedicated bus lanes, which DOT has been very supportive of traffic signal priority, and in my view, the most important piece of this is law enforcement. It's always been a challenge, but uh, we're getting there. Uh, and much like Naomi mentioned, we wipe the slate clean, you start from scratch. We've been 
working the same bus routes for many decades. And so this was a deep dive into how people travel now, where business centers uh, have grown, uh, working hand in hand with the public to determine what they want. So that's been uh, public outreach, street level engagements. We wrapped a number of transit vans to visit neighborhoods and uh, uh, other hubs to um, get real time feedback from our customers. A series of open houses, both in person and virtual, and then community uh, workshops, again, virtual and in person. Um, currently, as you probably uh, realize, we completed the Staten Island Borough bus network in uh, mid to late 2019. Uh, I'll go over the results of that shortly because I think it's indicative of, of the success of this redesign effort. Uh, the Bronx is in progress. That'll be completed in about two months' time. Uh, we just revised the draft plan for Queens. Uh, that's the first one we've had to revise based on new work patterns due to COVID. Uh, so that was released on March 29th. Uh, we're going into public comment on that now. The Brooklyn plan is in development and Manhattan remains pending. Uh, and just a quick overview of the results from Staten Island Express Bus Network redesign. So uh, the good news is we have um, added a lot of trips, 121 trips every weekday and 76 trips every Saturday, 50 trips on Sundays. We've added routes, we've added service. Our buses are moving a bit more than 5% faster than prior to the redesign. Uh, the service is more reliable. So 71.2% of customers finished their trip within five minutes of the scheduled time, which is up um, almost 10%. Shorter waits, a minute and 15 seconds versus a minute and 40. 29% uh, fewer trips with standees. Uh, we have improved transit priority. So at the Hugh Carey Tunnel, as an example, uh, buses are moving 29% faster during the evening rush. And then we continue to uh, look at adding to our bus time app and our MTA away app, or, sorry, my MTA app to show data that's valuable to our customers, such as seat availability. You know, are there standees on the bus? Should I wait for the next one, which is only two minutes behind the first that I see? So giving people the information that they need to make those smart decisions has probably been the most appreciated piece of this, uh, this data generation. And that is it. Welcome any questions you have. All right, th thank you very much, Mark. And lastly, we are going to cross the river to our friends over in New Jersey, RJ Palladino has a brief presentation on New Jersey Transit's new bus redesign program. Take it away. Great. And and just for an audio check, uh, you folks can hear me. Read you five by five. All right. Fantastic. Well, it's always interesting to go last in a series of uh, these presentations. I think what kind of brings together transit agencies is uh, some shared issues and New Jersey Transit is looking at bus network redesign and we have a couple efforts underway. Uh, bus network redesign was uh, established under our uh, 2030 strategic plan to look at uh, the bus network that New Jersey Transit provides, but New Jersey Transit, we have a large bus network uh, really across the state and our approach to this has been to look at redesign in markets. Uh, it's both a resource issue in terms of how much we can focus on at one time, as well as really needing to customize solutions that are different by market. And I think that's an important aspect of it. Uh, as was referenced, we branded it as new bus as a way of uh, sort of letting people know what we're doing with it. And we have two projects I can talk about today. Uh, one is the Nork uh, new bus uh, project or new bus Nork. The project uh, focuses on 38 routes that operate in Newark and extend out into the surrounding communities. We'll talk a little bit about where we are with that in a moment. And then uh, we also have a newer program that we have initiated, the Burlington Camden Gloucester 
or BCG project that we have in, I guess, what most people would think of as southern New Jersey, focused around the Camden and surrounding county area. That area is a bit different than Newark. It's a good contrast, uh, though there is some uh, certainly some urban portions of it. There are suburban and really even rural components of it. So it's a sort of contrast in types of issues that we look at. Our goals, I would think probably similar to our colleagues, is to redesign the bus network to realign with customer needs, enhance the customer experience, ensure inclusive and equitable mobility, and reverse some trends that we saw even pre-COVID on some ridership declines on certain routes. I mean, certainly coming out of COVID, our ridership has been stronger on local bus than it has necessarily been on interstate, but still the overall trend over time had been for some declines and we're looking to make sure that our service is aligned with our customers' needs. Our approach has been uh, data-driven, uh, either hard data and also feedback from the public. We did a market analysis to help determine where people are traveling, regardless of mode, where do people travel today? An in-depth service assessment to take a look at how our services were performing both pre-COVID and during the COVID period. And then the public and stakeholder input has been important to us to hear from our ridership base and non-riders. What do they want to see in a bus network in the future? One thing that we found that was interesting is something that, uh, and I don't know if this is a real term or just what we've been using, but we've been calling it in reach, but talking to our bus operations and our bus operators, particularly to get insights from them on issues that they encounter uh, in terms of efficiency, where they see need, where they, they uh, potentially see some area of potential efficiency. So, our outreach is, and this was one of the big challenges. Okay, it looks like those technical issues have come to bite us. Yeah, it does seem like um, he's coming back. Sorry, are you not? Could hearing? everyone uh, just on a bandwidth issue? Yeah, RJ, you were breaking up for about um, the past 30 seconds to a minute. Um, I, I had hoped being here in the office, I would get the maximum bandwidth. Uh, where did I drop <laughs> off? <laughs> I can't. I, it you sounded talking fine about here. outreach. Uh, can you? Okay. You were talking That's about fine. outreach. Uh, yeah. Okay. So our outreach uh, started during the uh, height of COVID, uh, which made some challenges, but I think we actually were able to get some uh, benefits from that. Uh, our methods included emails, but also on bus advertising, newspaper advertisements, social media, materials at local libraries to help get the message out of what we were looking at. We also had some language challenges. So here in Newark, we did translations uh, into both Spanish and Portuguese in addition to English, which was uh, important for us to connect with our uh, uh, constituencies. Uh, traditional maps and fact sheets and other static web content was enhanced by uh, an online interactive story map that people could really pour into the details of what was being looked at what we saw as existing conditions, and then what we were looking in draft uh, conditions. Um, Zoom meetings were our primary means of outreach, and we had good participation. I think sometimes it's a little bit easier for people, like today, uh, to get to a Zoom meeting. Some of you have, don't have bandwidth issues. Um, so we had some good participation there, and we conducted uh, public surveys to get feedback, both from our riders and non-riders. Some common findings that we're seeing that I think may be uh, seen by others as well. Customers want faster and more frequent service. That was the number one thing that we heard in Newark. We're starting to hear it in the Camden region, that that is what people, they want service that they don't have to think about, that they can go out and ride frequently and get to their locations quickly. Uh, a couple other things is that not all travel demand is during traditional peak hours and not all is work travel. So there's that off peak shopping, recreational, non traditional work, uh, medical, educational that all comes across as needs. And finally, uh, for next steps, um, 
we have our draft recommendations out for NORC. We're anticipating release of final recommendations for NORC in the near future. Uh, that we would then get into the implementation phase, how we how we uh, basically carry out that service. Uh, on the BCG, Burlington, Camden, Gloucester uh, service, uh, we're at the input stage, gathering input, initial brainstorming on uh, some potentials and interacting with the community. And then finally, future markets, uh, we do anticipate that bus network redesign will continue in other markets uh, as we move forward. And uh, this will be a progressive program that we move across our various markets uh, within the state of New Jersey. And hopefully you heard most of that. Um, and we, thank we you for got your time. That. We got and that. Good. All thank right. you very much. Thank you, RJ. Are there any questions in the chat pod specifically on these five uh, presentations or these these initiatives? Yes, there are quite a few. How much time do we have to um, to go through them? Say 15 minutes, Stephanie. Okay, uh, so we'll start with um, back at the presentation um, from uh, David. So this was for Nassau County, the shared mobility. Um, the uh, one question for for uh, David: Which route will the T route follow between Hempstead and Roosevelt Field Mall? Will it be the N16 or the N35? Sure. So it's neither. It would be a new uh, dedicated route uh, for that service. Thank you. Uh, another question for you. Will it be possible for the charging station being built for the electric vehicle buses to be used by other vehicles, say maybe shared mobility vehicles? The charging facility is on a nice bus um, property, um, so it would only be for those buses and um, you know, planning for future expansion of the electrified fleet, there would likely be um, probably at capacity, uh, just trying to, you know, slot in the buses um, during certain times. So I would say that's not likely, um, but uh, certainly, you know, open to, to hearing how that might work um, if, if you guys have ideas. Thank you. Um, this question kind of came in between the presentations. I think this might be for Chris's uh, uh, presentation on Suffolk County. Uh, what percentage increase in ridership will result from shifting the goals from 50% ridership to 65% ridership? Do you estimate a 30% increase in ridership? Hi, this is Chris. Um, we don't have, and, and we will not be making ridership projections for the new routes. Um, you know, as we all know, transit riderships depends on, on many different factors. Uh, we believe the new network has been designed so that more people can access uh, more jobs, education, commerce, other opportunities by transit in, in less time than uh, they currently can, which promotes high ridership potential. So, um, you know, it, and also it's our understanding that where these um, system uh, reorganizations or, or uh, reimagines have been conducted, uh, ridership levels have increased. So. Um, we are, you know, planning on um, a ridership increase, but we're not going to be uh, giving specific percentages or numbers. Thank you. Uh, this is a question also for you, um, uh, Chris. Um, let's see. What systems will be in place to ensure timed connections are consistently made? Um, even with the 15% buffer, there may still be occasional instances of buses arriving after other buses were scheduled to leave. Will they radio the other drivers to hold the connections? Uh, we're going to be working with our consultant to finalize the plan to execute the time connections. I mean, yes, you know, it will include such methods as, you know, uh, radio communications. I'm not sure if it's going to include, um, AVL solutions um, where, you know, they can do it without talking on the radio, but uh, we will work with them to um, to finalize that plan to, to maximize the uh, the time connections. And a couple more, a few more for you as well. In the isochrome model, are the timed transfers accounted for, or is it assumed that the average wait time will be half the headway? Um, that's a really good question. I actually looked at some of these questions before, so I was trying to formulate some of the answers. Um, this particular question, I'm going to have to take back. Otherwise, um, we will be having a uh, presentation on um, the reimagined transit study at this 
week's PFAC meeting um, at the, um, so if you want to um, bring that question there, we might be able to answer that uh, or else I can inform the speaker of that one. So um, it's a really good question. I don't have the exact answer, but I'll, I'll take it back. Thank you. Um, one more question as part of the network redesign, will more buses interline th uh, through rooted? Uh, and if so, would they be marketed to customers as a potential 1 seat ride? Um, it's likely that our contracted bus service operators will continue to interline in order to maximize operating efficiency. I don't think this is likely to be something that will be advertised or marketed to customers though. Thank you. Uh, three more questions. Will the BRT system be a separate project or will some of these routes, uh, e.g. Port Jefferson to Pachogue, be in lieu of the BRT? Um, well, the, the New York State 110 BRT is a separate project. Um, these projects have been informed by each other and, and are working in concert. Um, so, to address the, 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 some of the question about um, will they be in lieu of the BRT, the proposed BRT from Patchogue to Stony Brook along CR 97 has been effectively canceled after issues which arose during public outreach and in connection with the research being done for the reimagined transit study. So some of the new routes that are part of the draft new network are in effect taking the place of, of the CR 97 BRT, but the New York State 110 BRT is, is an enhancement to the existing or, or enhancement to the draft new network. Thank you. And two more. Um, what is the timeline for when the schedules and stops will be finalized for Suffolk County? Will there be an opportunity for public comment on the finalized schedules? Um, well, we've, we've held our public hearings on the draft new network um, and, and you will be using that feedback to develop the final network. That was really the opportunity for the public to provide feedback and suggestions. Um, so there's not going to be any further opportunity for public comment on the finalized schedules or timetables. Thank you. And last question, then we move on to Westchester. Um, besides the Connect Long Island website, what plans are there to advertise the new Suffolk County network to ensure that everyone is aware? For example, posters, flyers at main train stations, bus stops, shopping centers, et cetera? Um, you know, definitely we're going to employ as, as many of these measures as possible. There's going to be a, a robust rollout effort, um, which is going to be supported by our consultants, um, as well as, you know, staff here in public works and economic development and planning. So we, you know, we plan to um, get the word out. This is one of the, you know, it's probably the most important project that we've had um, you know, in the past 20 years. So we're going to make sure that everyone's aware of, of what's going on. Uh, it's also going to be supported by um, an effort, you know, replacing um, bus stop signs and information at the bus stops. So um, people understand that the new system is coming and, uh, you know, how to access the new system. We're planning on redesigning the Suffolk County Transit website at the same time. So we have a lot that's going on and um, there will be a very strong focus on making on public awareness of the new system. So much. Thank you. Uh, now we move to uh, Naomi Klein's presentation on Westchester County mobility and bus redesign study. Um, this question for Naomi for Westchester, what is the approximate timeline for final implementation of the revised routes and transfer policies? Well, we're looking at a phased implementation plan and um, kind of clustering <clears throat> recommendations together that that are dependent on each other. So we, we really don't want to take away a route uh, or a service without having something else in place. Like we, we say something that's going to be replaced with a micro transit zone. We wouldn't take it away until the micro transit service was in place. And we're also uh, considering the time, considering the timing of our um, contract with our private operator, which expires at the end of 2023. Some things will be in place uh, with the new operation. Thank you. Uh, one more question for you. I imagine that last mile is a big problem in Westchester. What types of tools are you using to evaluate where to integrate microtransit zones with the fixed route network? Um, well, in some instances, those are ideal locations and markets for uh, micromobility. Um, but we're also uh, looking at other other types of 
of options too. And I have to say, we're working with the MTA right now. They're doing a first mile, last mile study, and um, they're lo they're looking at different station topologies and examples that could um, be appropriate in one community versus another. And um, and uh, we're we're hoping that that's going to have a lot of value also um, to address first and last mile uh, issues. Hey, thank you. And last question. Uh, interesting idea to offer free transfers between Metro North Railroad and the B line bus. Any plans to offer free transfers between the B Bronx Manhattan four and the local B line buses, um, New York City MTA bus and a Metro North Railroad? Um, the um, that that one bus route um, is an exception in our system. It's a, an express route. Uh, from White Plains uh, to Manhattan, and right now it has a different fare structure. So we haven't, we certainly haven't ruled it out. Um, you know, it's it's just it's one uh, route within the system, and uh, it's it's definitely something that could be considered. Thank you so much. Uh, now we move on to questions for Mark with the MTA bus network redesign. Um, question for Mark: Will the Staten Island local buses be included in the redesign? Only the express buses were changed in late 2018, early 2019. Uh, eventually they will. We've been focused on our express bus routes across the boroughs first. So once we finish that work in Manhattan, which is the last borough to, to be tackled, we'll then address local bus, bus routes. Thank you. And I see you answered this question in the chat as well. Um, there was another question. Is the Standy data from the uh, from the pre COVID timeframe? And just for everyone's reference, um, uh, Mark answered yes, eventually, but we plan to complete the redesign exercise, including Manhattan before addressing local route networks. Um, and that Standy data is a real time feed. Was there anything right. else you wanted to add to that? Mark? Uh, no, it's just it, again, it's a real time feed. It's uh, through our bus time app as well as our my MTA app. So, uh, you know, we we do have historical data data going back to pre pandemic, but uh, the real time data is really what people appreciate to make that bus choices. And I think that's all the questions we have uh, in the chat for now. So thanks very much for your time. All right. All right. Thank you very much. And with that, I'm going to hand the meeting back over to Jerry to talk about moving forward NIMTIC's new regional transportation plan. Thanks, John. And thanks to the uh, panelists from the previous sequential presentation. It was very substantive and very concise. So, um, and, and again, more great questions, a lot of interest. In this work, um, I'm going to get us out of here on time, though. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I'm actually going to table part of it for our next meeting, but I want to explain uh, why that is and what we're doing. Before getting into that, though, I got to point out that um, the three county efforts um, that were described earlier, plus the, um, I think Naomi mentioned the MTA's first mile, last mile effort, um, all have made. Um, uh, made use of federal funds that have come through the NIMTIC planning process, which which is really excellent. I think what we're seeing here is, um, particularly because of the pandemic, but some of these uh, efforts predate the pandemic, but particularly because of the pandemic, there is a look on the transit side for innovation and for uh, responsiveness to this new situation that's, that's, uh, that's presented itself in terms of uh, at-home work and changing travel patterns and so on. And uh, it's, it's great that the MPO process uh, can play a role in that um, and, and be a source of resources to do that. So if we're talking about um, the recommendations that are related to TISMO of, of the, our new plan moving forward, uh, which was adopted uh, last September, um, that, that's prominent um, in, in, in the sense of trying to better integrate systems with each other and also trying to integrate new services with existing systems. Um, so I think we're seeing that. We're seeing that actually uh, being carried forward by the member agencies of NIMTIC, and that's, uh, that's really good and really healthy. Um, I would also point out that um, 
there are about a dozen recommendations from uh, the moving forward for strategies and actions that are related to uh, transportation systems management and operations. And uh, we are now discussing all of those with our members. And what I want to table for the next meeting is we're going to be working with them to identify um, uh, specific tactical uh, uh, items for the planning process moving forward. And uh, that'll be more fully developed in time for the next uh, meeting. Uh, also, um, since we've had a lot of substantive presentations today and we're probably all pretty tired, at this point, it's it's not a good idea to go into a lot of detail about these. Just know that we'll make this um, earlier on the next uh, uh, agenda and uh, and highlight it uh, going forward. So having said that, um, in terms of a next meeting, we don't have a specific date, but we're probably looking for something in the fall. Um, prior to the pandemic, the network had been meeting, uh, its public meetings were basically twice a year, um, and we'd like to keep that up. Um, and future agenda items, uh, as you're hearing today, uh, the network is primarily a network. We're sharing information. We're gathering information from other places and innovations that uh, other organizations, cities, and agencies are, are undertaking that can inform what we're doing here. Uh, and we're sharing information between our members through this network. So uh, that is first and foremost, but it is also an advisory group. And uh, there may be uh, advisory uh, recommendations coming out of this network for the NIMTEC members to consider going forward and the MAP forum members also. So um, our agendas will be focused on, on those two functions of this Metropolitan Mobility Network. Um, certainly um, one agenda item for next time will be the uh, recommendations from the plan and the more detailed uh, activities that will result from those. And uh, we'll be looking at any number of new topics to bring information in on. Uh, and a lot of that will be based on the recommendations from the plan. So, having said all that, you'll be hearing more information about um, a potential date in advance of that date, at least two weeks in advance, if not longer. Probably we're looking at an October, November timeframe. Um, and I'd just like to thank uh, again, Kim Lucas and, and the presenters from um, uh, MTA, New Jersey Transit and the three counties for their very substantive uh, discussions and presentations of information today and the impressive initiatives they're undertaking. So having said all that, I'm about to give you back 15 minutes of your time today. Um, enjoy your lunches. Thank you for your attention and uh, we will see you again in the fall. Take care everyone and stay safe. Take care.